Ja. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Everyone here in Port Townsend in uh, Sklalem country. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the indigenous peoples of the area. This is our first time doing this experimental um, setup. We have you folks here live, and we have folks chiming in from around the world on the Zoom webinar. And we have these panelists here, and we have a couple panelists online. So I'll first in introduce the panelists, and then we'll introduce the topic, and we'll, uh, we'll get going. Um, so first of all, uh, Derek Jensen, um, author of many good books, including The Myth of Human Supremacy. Derek, say hello, hello real quick. We'll see you. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> all right. And next we have Jacob Shockey here. He is the uh, Riparian Restoration uh, Program Director for the Applegate Partnership and Watershed Council and the owner of Beaver State Wildlife Solutions. Um, and Precious Feedy here, um, community builder and trainer at the Africa Center for Holistic Management. And, and you guys can correct me if there's anything else you want to add about yourselves, of course. And Mike Meese here, co-founder of the Buffalo Field Campaign. And we have Dan O'Brien on the screen. He's the founder of the Wild Idea Buffalo Company. Hello, Dan. Howdy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Say something I'm, again. I'm amazed by all this. Perfect. So if it works, yeah. It works. It's the mute thing. Great. All right. Well, as you all know at the... Uh, opening ceremony wasn't that beautiful today by the way and I, I really appreciated that and um, I love how grandma Aggie charged us all to join her in being a voice for the voiceless um, and I, I hope that this panel is uh, is contributes to our collective efforts for that um, so as we all know preserving protecting and restoring ecosystem function is an idea whose time has come and it's still evolving what we, what we mean by that. Um, we've all heard the quote, we can't solve a problem with the same sort of thinking that created the problem. And, you know, reading recently in the Babylonian creation myths, as far back as that, we see this pattern of, this thinking pattern of mistaking the natural order for chaos that needs to be tamed and controlled, starting draining wetlands and, you know, the beginning of a lot of things and we're still carrying on that narrative when it, we're actually learning that the natural order is what keeps chaos at bay it's what protects us it's it's our mother and, and it protects us this natural order that we mistook for chaos and a big part of that natural order and what holds it all together is all these other intelligences besides humans that actually run the show and we're, we're a part of this show so this panel is about how can we ally with our non-human co-earthlings on this planet um, and so to do that we're going to start with um, we'll start with Derek and then Jacob and then Dan and then Precious and then Mike uh, each sharing for around 10 minutes or so um, on, on your work and what what you do um, and 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 we'll, we'll see what what all ties together and um, what connections get made we're gonna the beaver and the buffalo and and the interaction between holistic management and wildlife will be some of the exemplars that we'll be discussing. But this also applies, of course, to forest intelligence and mycorrhizal networks and plant intelligence and, and snails and everything. But um, these cute, adorable, charismatic keystone species are kind of easy to, to tackle first, to kind of wrestle with some of these ways of thinking. So to kick it off, um, Derek, can you start us off and uh, help us frame this story here? Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. And first, I want to thank uh, Mike for, well, Mike Meese too, but I want to thank Mike for setting up this entire conference, which is just fabulous, and I wish I was there. And I would like to thank you for setting up this panel. Um, and I would like to thank the other panelists, A, for your work in the world, and B, for, for sharing all this. Um, and then uh, over the decades, so many indigenous people have said to me that the first and most important 
difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is that even the most open-minded Westerners generally perceive listening to the natural world as a metaphor, as opposed to the way the world really is. And uh, most of us in the West, most of us in the civilized world have been taught to perceive the world as consisting of resources as opposed to other beings to enter into relationship with. And how you perceive the world affects how you behave in the world. And if you, there's a great line by a Canadian lumberman. When I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you're going to treat them one way. And if when you look at trees, you see trees, you'll treat them another way. And if when you look at this particular tree, you see this particular tree, you'll treat it differently still. Um, there are a lot of, there's this great line I read one time, which is uh, unquestioned assumptions are the real authorities of any culture. One of the unquestioned assumptions of this culture, well, I'll back up a sec. There's this great, great little story I want to tell about Charlotte Perkins Gilman. She read the, the Buddha story about how the Buddha went out into the world and he saw everybody killing each other and everybody eating each other. And that was pretty horrifying. And she said, I want to change one word and it'll change everything, which is I went out into the world and I saw everyone feeding each other and it was all good. And if you perceive the world in that different way, you'll act differently in the world. And one of the central myths of the dominant culture is that evolution, natural selection is based on this strict competition, this, uh, Basically, whoever can exploit the most effectively can uh, will survive and will uh, will thrive. And the way you thrive is by being the most exploitative, the most capitalistic, coincidentally, um, the most sociopathological. And that um, that is a rationalization for capitalism. And it's so silly that um, I can disprove it in one sentence if you give me a couple semicolons. <laughs> Those creatures who've survived in the long run have survived in the long run, semicolon. You don't survive in the long run by hyper-exploiting your surroundings, semicolon. You survive in the long run by actually improving your habitat. And how do we think that the world got to be so rich and fecund and completely full of life in the first place. It wasn't by everybody exploiting everybody. It was by the salmon make this forest a better place by living and dying. And the bears make this place a better place by living and dying. And that's, that's how you survive in the long run. I mean, prairie dogs make the prairie. And buffalo make the prairie, and the grasses make the prairie, and they all work together to, you know, I just read this thing yesterday, uh, literally yesterday, about how hippos uh, play a really important role in stopping toxic algae blooms because they eat a lot of plants who are uh, rich in silica, and then they poop in the river, and then it flows down the river. They, they actually move a whole bunch of silica into the river, which then inhibits the toxic algae blooms. And I just, I, I find that story just beautiful and extraordinary, and it makes me think of this line by David Ehrenfeld, and I know I'm jumping all over, but those who've read my books know that this is what I do. And, um, there's a story by David Ehrenfeld, nature's not only more complex than we think, it's more complex than we can think. And I'm thinking of another time. I was sitting, I live like three miles from the ocean, and I was sitting by the ocean one day with a friend of mine who's a fisheries biologist. And out of the middle of nowhere, he just suddenly said, Did you know that sharks, uh, that their rough skin is, that if they had smooth skin, they wouldn't be able to swim as fast? But because their skin is rough, it uh, changes the flow around their bodies from laminar to turbulent, which somehow makes it so they can swim faster. And I just looked at him and I said, so do you, do you believe in some sort of intelligent creator behind all of this 
beauty that we see. And he gave me this answer that I, I just love and I've thought about ever since, which is there is great intelligence in time. And that is if you have the sharks living in the oceans for years, they will develop a really intelligent way to live. And I was asking the same guy, you know, I, I live in bear territory and there's, I normally see bears in a day. And one of the things they do is they kill trees. They, the, the, the young bears, the young male bears will, uh, if we could just walk a little ways this way, we would see some. The young male bears, when they're trying to impress females, will stand up and they'll grab a tree over their head and then they'll break it over their back. And they're basically doing the same thing as teenage boys do when they you know, are sort of strutting around the beach. They're saying, wow, look how strong I am. And they'll also kill trees by uh, stripping the bark. And I was asking that same friend, so what ecological function does that serve for bears to kill trees? And well, first off, dead trees are really important for habitat, for, for forests. I mean, everybody nests in trees, and they need dead trees. And he said also, there's a mixed tan oak for forests. And dug firs uh, grow faster, they grow taller, they reproduce more and they reproduce more um, frantically, more, more, they reproduce more. And they basically have every advantage over tan oak, except that bears really like to eat dug fir. And so one of the things that bears do in that dug fir tan oak forest is they kill some of the dug firs, which allows the tan oaks to live, which allows the tan oaks to make acorns, which allows everybody to eat the acorns. And so my point is that the question to ask, and I only got a couple more things to say, the question to ask is, is the world a better place because you were born? And is the world a better place because of what you're doing? And is the world, by the world, by the way, I don't mean society, I don't mean the economy. When I, you know, people, when I was in college, people would say, what are you gonna do when you got in the real world? And it's like, what they meant is, what are you gonna do when you have to get a job? And it's like, no, when I got in the real world, I'm gonna roll around in the dirt, that's what I'm gonna do. And so that's one thing, is that's the real world. And is the world a better place? And salmon make the world a better place? Prairie dogs make the world a better place? So this all leads to the question, and this will be my last question really, which is how do you make decisions then understanding that the world is incredibly complex, more complex than you're capable of thinking? How do you make decisions that will make it so the world is a better place? And one short answer, well, there's two answers I wanna give. One is that we have to trust, as was said earlier, we have to trust the natural order. What's the prairie knows what is best for the prairie. The buffalo know what is best for the prairie. The buffalo know what is best for the buffalo. The prairie dogs know what is best for the prairie dogs. So we have to trust that. And then the other thing is um, that, you know, it was where I live is on Talawa Indian land. And the Talawa lived here for at least 12,500 years, if you believe the myths of science. And if you believe the myths of Talawa, they lived here since the beginning of time. And in either case, it was a long, long time. And when the Europeans arrived here, the place was a paradise with the Klamath River just south, black and roiling with fish. And, and people will sometimes say, well, you know, the Indians affected the land where they lived too. But here's the thing. If you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years, your land use decisions are going to be much different. So how do we make our decisions as to what is best for the land? One, we trust the land. And two, we plan on living there in place for 500 years. Can you hear me, Mike? I don't think they can. I could hear you. Dan and I can hear each. I don't know why I'm talking more loud because they can't hear me anyway. Well, we're a long way away. So. <laughs> <laughs> could you not hear uh, Jacob? 
Oh, I had us. I had us muted, so I didn't hear. I apologize. I had us muted. Okay, thank you very much, Derek and Jacob. I'm gonna have two different mutes going on with this new. This is the first day of a whole new thing, so thank you for the patience, guys. Jacob, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you can join us now. <laughs> Um, so there's been this pause in, in those of us who are working in um, restoration around salmon habitat and, and the pause is really we're, we're spending a lot of money and it doesn't seem to be working. And you know there's folks that are going to be more open about acknowledging that and less open about acknowledging that but that seems to be um, what we're seeing. And so um, Beaver have really started to to quietly emerge first as rumors and then as whispered conversations and then people have started being brave about pushing beaver in the world that I work in the world of biologists trying to plan restoration um, for recovery of, of fish and it's exactly what you're saying Derek um, we can't fully quantify all that they're doing for the landscape but what they're doing for the landscape is is so much more than I can do with a half million dollar grant, um, and they and they do that for free, right? So even if we're just looking at it from dollars and cents, leaving them alone to do what they do and have been doing um, is is incredible amounts of effort and money that we spend trying to emulate um, what what they know. So in my world, um, there has become this this sort of rumbling rebellion of, of folks looking to ally with beaver uh, in a sense for our own selfish needs in that we're, we're, we're focusing on the fish recovery as something that we really, really need to see happen, especially in my area. Uh, they were just recategorized. Uh, I live in Southern Oregon, Northern California, and the area that I live, the Applegate, um, the Coho, are at high risk of extinction recently. and, and um, the stream I grew up on that I swam in um, every summer, cool, deep water. The woman we bought the property from told me she grew up swimming in their cold, deep water. My two children walked down to a bone dry stream every summer. And, uh, and there was a, a beaver that tried to make a stand in this stream last year and put up a series of dams. Um, those dams persisted. And as the stream went dry upstream first and then downstream, um, that little sequence of beaver ponds had water for two months into the summer past when the rest of the stream was dry. Eventually that went dry too. The beaver left for a little uh, artificial pond and lived out the rest of the summer as a refugee in the pond. Um, what beavers do to a landscape should be considered a verb. And we can try to quantify it, right? We can say, you know, they're retaining sediments in massive amounts, and we see lamprey emesites on numbers that we can't see in these free-flowing creeks. You know, there's uh, the, the neotropical migratory bird habitat that is created in these ephemeral wetland systems, the uh, slowing of water and the groundwater recharge and the cold water that comes back into the system. Um, in my landscape, the first guy that came in um, from my European heritage was this this white dude named Peter Skin Ogden. And he came in with the Hudson Bay Company. His goal was to create a fur desert through my area. And the idea was, it, you know, beaver were a geopolitical resource at that point, and he was going to wipe them out. And uh, he was going to wipe them out so that the American fur trappers coming up the coast would reach a fur desert, and there would be nothing there for them, no furs and they would turn around and leave, and the Canadians up here would be uh, safe to continue with their fur dropping enterprise, right? So he, before the gold miners, before the loggers, there was the beaver trappers, and the beaver trappers came through and they wiped out every stream. And these were necklaces of beaver ponds. These weren't the free flowing trout streams that we see in a Patagonia catalog. These were, these were messy, complex, wetted, slow systems and um, our baselines have shifted now. And so I think in looking at what beaver do, we can try to quantify it. There's a lot of science now that allows biologists to you know, raise our voice a little bit more and, and pushing for the beaver. Um, but really we're dealing with an intelligence that we just need to get out of the way of. 
and uh, and allow them to persist on the landscape. Well put. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, Dan, let's take it to you next, Dan. I'm gonna. Okay. Can everybody hear me? You can hear me. Okay. Um, this uh, topic of, of allying with the non-human uh, parts uh, to help our fix our environment seems to me a, a little circular because, I mean, the non-human parts are our environment. And I know that out here on the prairie, uh, and it's, I'm interested, this whole beaver and the buffalo thing work really well together. but. I think that the problem is every here, everybody on this panel, I think probably agrees that the wisdom really is in the environment and we need to pay attention to that. Uh, that's kind of a given in my world. Uh, the question is how do we make it work? And of course the big obstacle in the whole thing is our version of capitalism. It's very hard. We have a, pretty good sized ranch here. We've got about a thousand buffalo and uh, about 35 acres per buffalo. Uh, that kind of works on a piece of paper. It would be way better if my buffalo could go to Kansas, but that's not going to happen. Uh, there's a fence around everything, including Yellowstone National Park. Uh, the Paradise Valley is a fence of, of uh, hunters, but it's still a fence. And I think that that issue is really our distorted view of capitalism. And, and if you've read The Wealth of Nations, which will put you to sleep, but you should read it anyway, uh, you'll find out that there's a lot of, res they talk about a lot of responsibility in there. And uh, I don't see that at all. I think that uh, Tim started off by saying that this is a, uh, you know, our, our culture is just, you know, who can exploit faster. And I think that that's what we're really up against. We know the biology as well as humans will ever get to know the biology. But what we have to do is cha change the uh, finances and the, uh, uh, the part of, of our life that really is built around uh, money. And I know that this is a very, very difficult thing to talk about because as soon as you say the things that I just said, uh, people begin to turn you off. But it's, it's a fact. If, uh, it's nice to have prairie dogs. We have thousands of acres of prairie dogs here. But uh, we also have a little trouble making ends meet. And prairie dogs are great. They're even greater if they're on somebody else's ranch. Uh, as far as the economy goes, but of course we got we have to have them, and that's what we fight against: is how do we make ends meet so we can send our kids to college uh, and uh, and still do the things that the six of us are talking about here today. And I think that we should quit beating around the bush. I know that uh, you know I've got a new book coming out and. It's pretty hard on capitalism, and I hate doing it because I know it's going to happen, but it's a responsibility, and it's a responsibility for all of us to stand up and say, too many people, too much consumption. That's the real problem, and we've got to figure out how to beat it. Thank you, Dan. And and thanks for mentioning your book, too. I forgot to say that in the intro. I've read two or, two or three of his books, and I highly recommend um, his writing. Yeah, very insightful. Uh, one of them is Wild Idea. Um, Dan, you want to name off a couple names real quick of books you recommend of yours? Uh, the Contract Surgeon, The Indian Agent, Wild Idea, Buffalo for the Broken Heart. Uh, there's 15 of them, so I'm really old. Find your books real quick. Okay, <laughs> let's move on to uh, Precious Feedy. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Am I on? Yes. And you, can you hear her? Yes. 
Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Precious Piri. <laughs> really? Thank you. But I don't blame anyone who says Fury because it does look like Fury. And I accept Fury as well. Um, Precious is from Zimbabwe in the Victoria Falls area. Those who've been to Vic Falls or those who've seen it on the net, you know, we welcome you. But we are more than just a beautiful place with the Zambezi River. That's where we also have the first hub of the Savory Institute called the Africa Center for Holistic Management, where I worked for full time with local communities for 10 years. But now I've grown into extending networking and sharing the stories of what we do in Africa. What is a Savory uh, certified field professional or educator in holistic management, but also with Regeneration International to spread and incorporate everyone who does regenerative work. So I'm really honored to be here. Today we're talking about allying with non-human species. Uh, when I got an email to be invited to this talk, I was like, yay, we get to talk about those who can't really speak for themselves. And that's really amazing because I'm from a heritage of the African landscapes or national parks. Actually, I live, my community is at the border of one of the biggest national parks in Zimbabwe, with large numbers of elephants, buffalo, the Wangi National Park. I'll learn, I'll just say a little bit of what we've learned from just wild animals and their relationship in the wilderness and how these have held the African rangelands be what they are. And that's an intelligence that we've learned from holistic management, which is a decision-making framework, looking at and studying natural systems and seeing how we can apply them to help ourselves. Because we are sinking fast, our rangelands are going down fast, food insecurity, uh, water, we, we lose what massive amounts of water when it rains. Um, African rangelands have really evolved with wild herbivores or ruminants and hunting animals like lion, leopard, hyena. This is how it happened. And this is how Alan learned it, Alan Savory, the founder of Holistic Management. He learned that and he's been teaching it across the world and uh, tools of holistic management based on that fact. So imagine a world, large herds of zebra, <laughs> buffalo, Antelope, Wildebeest, Impala, you name them, all of them, all the antelopes. These animals walk together. They all eat grass. Some of them eat trees, but most of them live off grass and water. But then because there are so many, they also have animals that hunt them, which we call pack hunting animals, that collaborate to hunt these large herds. These large herds are afraid of the hunting animals, so they keep together. There are thousands of them, different kinds, eating the same food. When they keep together, their wolves are plowing the land. And because they are afraid of lions and hyena and leopard, half the time you're jittery, they poop and um, urinate in these spaces. But because there are so many, no one wants to stay around their dung and urine for a long time. They have to keep moving. But they cannot move as separate individuals because the guys will get them. And so they keep together moving. So just imagine what they leave behind as they have moved. We have fertilizer, urea, and plowing, bringing back seeds and everything. When they go away, in Africa, it takes at least three months because we don't have lots of rain in these areas of the national parks. For three months, maybe they are not in this area. This dung, this urine, and this plowing, when it rains, it brings up the grass. When they are gone, what happens behind, we call it recovery. So this soil is rich in soil organic matter. There's lots of grass cover. I'm sorry, just Mike, stop touching your mic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Right. There's lots of grass cover, and when this uh, dung decays into the soil, it activates the soil organic matter. These animals are gone, with the pack hunters eating them as they go. 
but they keep recycling and coming back. But what they are doing, they are literally healing their own landscape that they live in. And these animals survived together with our people. We didn't have national parks before the conservation era, before it happened. Our people and wildlife and their cattle lived all together, sharing this resource of grass, grass that always works as the cover for the earth. Grass works as cover for the earth as much as our skin works for our flesh that is underneath. The reason why we're seeing perpetuated floods and desertification is because the skin of the earth is sick and earth keeps losing water. Earth keeps losing carbon into the atmosphere. But when cover is available, we have a healthy carbon cycle. In holistic management, we've learned from these and we use our cattle now to partner with our own animals, with their hooves and their dung and their urine, to bring them back to the land in large numbers, not little things scattered all over, which leads to overgrazing. But the wild animals never overgraze because they keep moving and they come back to a place when it has recovered. That's why you have flourishing streams of water, clean water. When it rains, you do not flash flood. Because when water is on top of the ground, it is a curse. You get floods and you lose lives. But when it goes down into the soil, you have underground water recharge, springs, and all life flourishes. This is what we've learned. And there's lots of intelligence under the ground. So micro, microorganisms that communicate with the roots using the food that comes and recycling it back to the plant. So there's lots of intelligence there. And I think we can share more as we go. But for now, that's what I'm going to share. <laughs> Great. All right, Mike Mies. Well, um, thank you guys for coming today. I know there's so much to choose from. I, I don't think I would be here if I, <laughs> if I had the option. Um, I'm just, first off. Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think you guys have great taste, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I just, there's a lot of brilliant things going on. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to choose which one you want to learn about. Um, First off, I'd really like to honor the First Nations people of this land for opening their land up and inviting us Hold the mic up. Here. Hold the mic to your face. Um, is this all right? Yeah. Um, I have had the honor for the last two, 22 years to live with the, the America's last wild, genetically free, um, semi caged in animals, but probably the best bit of habitat and wild free ranging herd we have left. And um, I would never be so naive to start a group without honoring the knowledge, wisdom, spirituality of the, of the First Nations people that, that, you know, obviously these, these mean so much to. And um, I had the honor of meeting this traditional Lakota woman, Rosalie Little Thunder. And um, we decided we were going to start this group together and, and try and bridge First Nations with, you know, white activists that, that care and wanted to make a change. And one thing she told me when we first started this um, just rings so true in my heart and keeps me fighting every day. And she said, Mike, I come from a nation that calls itself Tatanko Eate. And the closest that translates to your language is, I come from the Buffalo Nation. And these animals that you feel so strongly to protect and fight for are not animals to me and my people. They're our relatives, and that's how sacred they are. And I think in that lies the, 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 where we need to go. I heard a lot about how we need to start working more out of love and passion and connection and spirituality because in there lies a magic that we don't have anywhere else, you know? It's, it's like all these other people go and get on their knees and pray to this white god that came from Africa or, you know, from a continent that is not supposed to have white people. And... Um, that's where they get their connection. For me, I take a walk in the wilderness. For me, if there is a creator 
this is the gift that he or she gave us oh my God. to be able to live, to be in harmony, to have everything work the way it's supposed to. And, you know, we have this oxymoron of wildlife management and, and really what it should be is human management. <laughs> the animals don't need our help. I mean, they need our help of cleaning up our mess because they have no more places to go. Um, I, I forget your name, sir, um, the, the guy that raises bison. Um, Dan O'Brien. Dan, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, one thing that, that people don't understand about Yellowstone National Park is Yellowstone National Park is a high elevation plateau that traditionally gets some of the biggest snowfall in the lower 48. And this is not ideal year-round habitat for all the ungulates. And when these deep winter snows come, they all have to migrate to lower elevations to access the food. And that's where the problem is, as you stated, you know, waiting at the border are hunters. Or if they get too close to the border, the, even the park service will round them up and ship them to slaughter because the state of Montana has zero tolerance for these sacred animals to be themselves anymore, to be able to be the gift they are. And you explain so well about, you know, I always say the buffalo have this mighty gift because they walk through an area and they eat the grasses. And then with that process, they spill the seeds. Their hoofs are, are um, cleft, and so they till the soil as they walk. And, of course, right out the back end, you got this magic fertilizer that just keeps bopping out. And, and you'll see these same herds come through the same areas year after year. And they won't stay in that area. They'll come through and they'll replant and take care of the earth and then they'll leave. And they'll come back next year and they know that they've planted and seeded and taken care of this land and that it will help their generations continue. And this is the knowledge, the wisdom that we are so disconnected from, you know. And I really appreciate the involvement of the First Nations people here at this conference because really they are the wisdom keepers. They're, they're, they never had environmentalists. They all were environmentalists. There was no need for that word because they, they were part of this earth. And they never forgot that. And I hope that some of these lessons can be taught to all of us because, I mean, I have the honor of sitting, listening, watching, observing Buffalo every day. And the way they teach one another, you know, and they have leaders in their societies too. Traditionally, the, the lead mamas, the, the females are, are the big leaders. But Unlike our society, their job and their task and burden with taking care of everyone in the herd. Because in the buffalo world, everyone is equal. No one is better than one another. They just work together to make sure they all survive. And in that same realm, you know, where you were talking about all these different animals coming together um, the other day, we had an interesting story that happened, and, and a lot of environmentalist I told about this oh this is so sad but um it's calving season right now and all the big buffalo mamas are having their babies and one of the first calves born that we got to see a couple lucky coyotes came over and and killed that calf right in front of its mom it, the mom was separated from the herd well that mom stood guard for two days before she would allow those coyotes to come you know, eat her newborn, but that is the circle of life. They have a relationship with the wolves, with the coyotes, with the grizzly bears, and they all work together so that this mighty system that we try to comprehend works. And as Rosalie so used to always tell us, you know, the animals know their place. They know their job here on earth. We humans have been disconnected for what our purpose is here. And hopefully through this conference, through the meshing of many minds of us having the ability to communicate and tell each other what works where we are, what doesn't work so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then the last thing I really like to say is I like to see 
this mix of age. I, I like to see, you know, I'm getting my grays. I guess I'm jumping into the elder community or whatever that means. But um, <clears throat> our youth are just as important as our elders. And our youth can teach a lot of our elders these new technologies. I mean, I don't even know how to do this kind of stuff. The new McMe pages, I call them, you know, YouTube pages. And, you know, it's over our heads. But they are very important tools for us to reach the people who aren't at this conference and would never come to this conference. Because those are the true people we have to reach change and get involved because what we're doing is not out of our own selfish greed or something for our own personal betterment but hopefully what we're doing is trying to leave our, our a future for our children and their children and future generations because that's really all we can do in life is leave something better than we found it and feel proud about what we do. Walk tall. And if they're going to continue down this path, at least we tried our best to create a change to leave something for our children. And um, that's about all I got to say right now. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And we got plenty of time for conversation let's let's talk some i know we have all these beautiful minds here yes sir um we have uh the bluetooth mic speaking of technical stuff was giving us a little troubles so i'm going to walk around with my mic and just hold it hold it like this this one's working, working. is it working now okay great you want to okay let me come get it kind of locked in yeah let me get it <laughs> All right. Yeah, my name. It My name is Kurt Clevenson. Um, I've been an eco warrior for about thirty years. Uh, Can you hear? I got a network of about ten thousand schools, raised thirteen million dollars, setting up parks in South America and Amazon. So I've been at this a long time, and I preface what I'm going to say because what I'm going to say is probably going to piss people off. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of people talking about socialism versus capitalism, and I think it doesn't matter how we organize ourselves if we have no values. And we have no values as a society. The Soviet Union was the largest polluter ever. Chernobyl, they, just, they drained the Aral Sea to plant cotton, used massive quantities of of pesticides and herbicides on it. There's nothing compares to it, and they were a socialist country. So my, I, I really believe there's a shift happening. I, I live in Costa Rica, I have an Airbnb, I, I planted 25,000 trees. I see Americans coming, Canadians, etc., and it just resonates at a, at a level of their soul. They know they're missing something. And I see this happening. I picked up Outside Magazine and was reading it on a plane as I flew here. And the, the biggest thing in there, and tra uh, a travel magazine, Condé Nast, I think, like the biggest thing going on right now are hotels in nature that people are going to. This is like everybody wants to do this. There's a shift starting to happen. People know that climate change is going on. People are really afraid what's happening with extinction. And I think if we get into this thing where we start arguing about how we're supposed to organize ourselves, rather than discussing what our values are, we're going to alienate far too many people. I think what we need to do is focus on the values. We value nature. How we organize ourselves is secondary. And I'm just really afraid we're going to start alienating far too many people in what is a capitalist society. What's out of control is that it's become consumer capitalism. Yeah, that's where the sickness lies. The the Madison Avenue people, the smartest guys in the United States, are telling us if we consume this stuff, we're going to be okay. We don't have to feel bad. And people are starting to realize this is a big lie. That's all I got. Is there a question? Thank you. Um, whoever would like to comment, Derek, uh, Dan.
You both made um, you both both made statements about capitalism and the state that it's. Um, I'd be curious to know what you have to say. You want to go first, Dan? Well, yeah, I think that uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, the guy with the question, but uh, I think you're right about that. Uh, there's no sense in, in being divisive if we can help it. But there's also no sense in, in shying away. This is a real fight. This puts World War II to shame. And we got to get tough. And it does lie in the kind of capitalism that we're going to uh, put up with. And as you say, consumer capitalism, sure, that's, that's the issue. It's all about selling stuff. But I know, because I'm also a businessman, I know that you got to have something uh, because, you know, you, you got to give people jobs and all that kind of stuff. But we need to change the way we have built our capitalism. We need to have something that's a little more, that we're a little more capable of being proud of. I don't think anyone can be proud of, of the way we're running things now. Mike, jump in. All right. Did anybody else want to comment on that? Um, Derek, yeah. Um, I think that uh, the problem is much deeper than capitalism, socialism. I think that um, I'm going to lay out a pattern and let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years. Is that um, when you think of Iraq as the first thing that you think of, cedar forest so thick that sunlight never touches the ground. Because that's what it was. It was heavily forested. The first written myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting the hills and valleys of Iraq to make a great city. And uh, the Arabian Peninsula was oak savanna, and the Near East was heavily forested. Uh, you know, we all we've all heard of the cedars of Lebanon, and they still have one on their flag. It was heavily forested. Um, it ends up. I, I got a note from somebody from Corsica, maybe, I don't know, six months or a year ago saying that she had just learned that those desert rocks of the, the rocky hillsides of the Mediterranean are not what was there. It was all old growth forest and it was all cut. And then the, 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 the uh, soil went into the sea. And does anybody know why there aren't any penguins in the Northern hemisphere? There were, they were called great ox and they were as far South as France and they were killed. And, um, the cod were so thick in the North Bank that they were a, an impediment to shipping. And whales were so thick off the coast of New England that uh, it was like it was foggy all the time with their breath. And there were so many, so many whales in San Francisco Bay. Evidently, whales have bad breath because the air stunk from whales because there were so many. And my point is that The problem is a way of life that is based itself on overshoot and drawdown. And this goes back, and it's based on conquest. It's not based on living in place. This has been going on for 6,000 years. So I think we can mess around at the edges. And, and part of the problem is that we have been made dependent upon the very system that's killing the planet. So yeah, we gotta have jobs, we gotta pay our rent, but that's because the system has interposed itself between us and the real world. So we are dependent for our very lives on the system that is destructive. And so long story short, uh, yeah, Soviet Union was terrible. I am not going to excuse their environmental destructiveness. They were horrible. But um, industrialism and civilization itself are, are at, they were they were killing the planet long before long before the problem is a, a mindset that is not based on living living on the land so how do you change that derek well i think part of one of the things that needs to happen and this is going to make me even more unpopular is that, <laughs> um if space aliens came down from outer space and they were doing to the planet what the dominant culture is doing we would we would fight, we would, we would know what to do. And yet 
we have been, many of us have been, we pledged allegiance to this system from when we were young. And I, I, I think part of what we need to recognize is that war has long since been declared on the natural world by this culture. And yeah, I'm in no way, I'm a big believer in, I don't believe in the reform versus revolution dichotomy. I so believe in restoring specific places and in doing what you can around the edges. And at the same time, we have to recognize that if all we do is reform, then this culture is going to continue to grind away until there's nothing left. And I think what we need to do is restore absolutely and protect absolutely. And, um, and then we also need to recognize that the entire system itself is toxic to life on earth. The system, I'm not saying humans are, not at all, but we have been born into a system. We, I'll speak for myself. I was born into a system that is inherently destructive and functionally destructive. And um, anyway, so I think, and it's like a doctor friend of mine says, the first step toward proper diagnosis is, no, correct diagnosis is the first step toward proper treatment. And yeah, we need to work you know, everything. I love Mike Mises' work. I love the work of everybody here. And at the same time, the entire system, so long as it continues, it's going to continue to grind away. Right. So the first step is to just recognize that. Yeah, I'd kind of like to put it in today's context, too, of what we're dealing with. You had brought up earlier, you know, that there's this new democratic socialism. And, and of course, in America, the word socialism rhymes with communism and it scares the hell out of everybody. And so, you know, we have these new up and coming incredible new Congress women predominantly that are pushing for, for new things. But, you know, it's like, I look at this green new deal. Well, the word green has been tarnished, and I don't know if it was Al Gore or whoever it was, but, you know, the second people hear a Green New Deal, there's half the country or a portion of the country that's just going to shut it off because they don't have a relation to it. That puts them on the left with the loonies, and they can't be associated with that. So instead of that, why don't we say something like, our children's future New Deal, where everyone has children. They can relate to it. It's something we can unite around. And, and so we got to take the prejudice that we're stuck with and work to, to always, you know, if we can have these conferences all our lives and, and sit around and pat each other on the back and preach to the converted. That does not create change. We got to change the people that don't think like us and we got to give them common ground that isn't tarnished with prejudice words that makes them want to join in with this because it's not for us and our liberal leftness. This is for your children's future. And that puts a whole new hat on the whole story. And that's where we got to start taking our energy is quit making all our words be words that we understand. We want the most naive people in the world to be able to cling on to it. I mean, one of the biggest heroes in my life um, was Bob Marley, because Bob Marley said all the pure, purest, truest words you could ever want to hear, but he made them so simple a baby could understand them. And that's how we have to educate people. That's how we have to move this forward. And that's how I would answer that question. All right. Thank you. All right. Did anybody do you have anything to say on that before we move on to the next question? I have a little to add. Sure. Um, so I work out on the landscape with a lot of folks, and most of the folks that are out on the landscape are not the green lefties. Yeah. You know? And I think this is a really important point, too. When we're talking about silos and we're talking about political strategies, we need to realize that ostracizing the folks that work the land is not in anyone's best interest. And the people that make their li li um, livelihood in the woods know a hell of a lot more about the woods 
than the folks that are living in Portland and Seattle. And they feel really defensive when they feel like folks that don't have the experience are telling them what's going on with the biology. And it's the same with, you know, I was out talking with a beaver trapper. He kills beaver, right? And he knew more about the wetland ecosystems than most fish biologists I've ever talked to. There's a, there's a book called Three Against the Wilderness. And it's a, uh, it's a family of trappers that went up into the back country of Canada in the 1800s. And he was, he was a trapper. And as a trapper, he needed um, a landscape that would be productive in fur. So he moved into this wetland that had been burned through with a wildfire and been trapped out. Him and his son started building fake beaver dams throughout this landscape because they needed the productive landscape for their fur. And eventually, they built enough of an approximation of a beaver wetland that the muskrat were back. And when the muskrat were back, the coyotes moved in. Yeah. And then they were able to make a living on coyotes and muskrats. Eventually, they persuaded the Canadian government to give them um, a couple of beavers. They got beaver out on the landscape. The beaver populated and took over, and they started sustainably harvesting beaver, too. Those were fur trappers doing restoration, yeah. <laughs> okay? And we need to be really careful about ostracizing those allies that know a lot about the landscape. And when we start down language of Green New Deal, we get into dangerous country where the people that are making their living off the lands are being pushed away. So that, that's what I would add to that. Yeah. A little humility. <laughs> yeah. Humility, humility, humility. Uh, Precious, anything to add before we move on? Hello. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I may not add anything in the context of the USA, but a little bit in the context of um, how conservation, national parks, and things like that have affected probably people living at the periphery of these national parks. Um, maybe just a hint on consumerism and how making money from natural resources has affected my people or local communities. First of all, we have a relationship with wildlife. I think someone used the word that they are relatives. Would, yeah. My surname is Piri, but that's marriage. My, what do you call that, maiden? Maybe. The maiden, sorry, sometimes the English runs away <laughs> because I don't speak it every day at home. Uh, my maiden surname is Duve. Duve is zebra. Mm -hmm. Yes. So zebra is an, that beautiful striped animal. So we have things called totems. My totem is Duve Mtembo's Tembayo in Gudulentli Amashat, which means Duve, the most beautiful striped animal in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So th in that case, if a zebra was edible, my people do not eat zebra because zebra is my relative. So those who have a buffalo totem, they do not eat buffalo because buffalo is your relative. But now because of uh, the consumerism, trophy hunting, our people watch the people on the other side of the road benefiting financially. And that respect is being lost at the risk of really all animals being at risk of poaching and all that. So, um, commercializing wildlife has made everyone lose respect but think of wildlife in terms of money it's just it's just an example of how things are deteriorating on another scale in in african communal lands great yeah thank you um then before we move on uh, one person online says so appreciated with the first audience member shared Wondering if he can share his name or anywhere to find your work in Costa Rica. You can find us online at ar arboredencr.com. All right. Thank you. We're going to get to uh, another one here. I want to get one from online real quick. Um, just to include everybody because we have, you can't see them, but they're here too. Just like, um, William Clancy asks, I assume this is for you, Jacob, what are the barriers to large-scale beaver reintroduction? So the state that I live in is the beaver state, 
we have a beaver on our flag. We're the only flag in the United States that's got two sides and one side has a beaver on it. Um, and yet, in my state, beaver are considered a predator. Um, in state statute, they're a vegetarian, but they made the predator list because if you make the predator list, it's really easy to then kill you. <laughs> so you can take out as many beaver as you want, however you want, whenever you want, without talking to anyone on private land. On public land, they're a fur bearer, which means you need to get a fur bearer to take license, and then you can take them out with no bag limit. Um, and there's voluntary reporting. So there's, there's a big hurdle for getting beaver on the landscape. Um, I have a business, Beaver State Wildlife Solutions. I work with folks um, where there are beaver on the landscape to stabilize the situation enough so that the beaver can stay there, right, in close proximity with, with people. We have beaver in, in, in North America. We have beaver throughout our landscape, um, but their population is such that on the main, so where I live, there's main stem rivers and tributaries, right? Main stem river, it's deep, cold water. If you're a beaver, that's, that's the best real estate in town, right? There's willows everywhere, they eat the willow. Um, there's no need to dam. Beaver dam to avoid predators. They're, they're very graceful in the water but they get out on land and they're six pounds of meat and fat, you know? And, uh, and so these main stem river systems are often where you find the remnant beaver populations because that's the best habitat, but that's also where the high value real estate is and folks move in and they plant beautiful landscapes with Japanese maple right down by the river and then the beaver eat the Japanese maple and then the colony gets trapped out, right? And so, Biologists have this term, um, keystone species. Uh, we also have this term called uh, carrying capacity. And carrying capacity is basically, you know, there's a certain amount of animals that that system can take, and then the animals are forced somewhere else. And so until we reach carrying capacity on main stem rivers, we're not gonna see beaver up into the tributaries. The teenagers are never gonna be forced to go make your living where you have to build a dam, right? And they need to be forced to go make their living where they have to build a dam if we're going to see the cascading benefits in salmon country, especially, or in drought-prone country that um, beaver offer to the landscape. So there's, there's a, a number of limiting factors that we can look at, but one of them, the primary one, is ourselves and, and sort of the tax on just the numbers of animals out on the landscape. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I saw a hand back there first. Let me come back to you with this microphone. And go ahead and say your name if you like to. So. Okay, great. Um, I love that beavering is a thing, now a verb. <laughs> to take. But my comment first is around the projection of big ideas, and it seems to me as I was just recently driving through some very small towns through our country and with all of these beautiful ideas coming through me as to how, how can we help and it seems to me that the land was like I got this contraction in my heart and said are you listening first and if I don't stop and listen then essentially I felt this wound of colonization come through me that if I'm going into these areas of the quote-unquote naive and I'm projecting my big ideas, how is that any different than what has happened to the indigenous land? So sit and listen. And then I was like, well, what about with the earth? All these big ideas that you just eloquently spoke on with the beaver. It's like, are we just watching? Do we need to actually do so much? But my question was the other day, um, I was walking on North Beach. I live here. My name's Jamie Lashbrook. And there were five baby ducks over on North Beach. And it was a very windy day, maybe some of you remember. And most people were walking by them and just looking at them and kind of gawking at them. And I got really close. And I was like, oh, sweet. And then there was something very odd. They were in distress. There was no mother. There was no nest. And there was no way for them to swim because the wind was so big. And there was no way for them to fly because they were so little. And there was that moment in me where I was like, okay, not my child, not my problem. And I was like, oh, but then how does that bleed out into everything? Not my child, not my problem. But is it? 
And so I made the decision to take the time and I scooped them up and took them to a wildlife bird rescue, which is open 24 hours a day here in Port Townsend, by the way. But I still have this lingering question that when do we interfere? Because in that moment, I didn't know, like, are they stranded because of something that humans did? And if the humans interfered and these baby ducks are now going to die and starve, then yes, that is my child, that is my problem. But if an eagle swooped down and took their mother, and this is a natural process, do I let them just stay there and do I walk away? So there's my question. Where's that discernment within me and how can I listen better to that? Yeah, thank you. Well, I have a, an example that relates directly to you. Am I feeding back or you? Um, one time through a massive hazing operation um, using helicopters moving a herd of over 300 buffalo with one to two week old babies involved. And of course, you can't have utter chaos without a, a baby getting separated and, and being all alone. And, and that particular, per, you know, exactly like you said, because that was a human cause problem, we had no problem going and capturing that little baby, taking it to five other moms with their, with their babies and letting her go. And thank goodness they took her in. And, that was, but we had another incident once um, over in a house and area where this this mom had a baby and it died of natural causes, or it, it, she left it of natural causes, and she left with her baby of, of last year, and she, you know, in my mind, she wanted to reserve, she knew that this calf was going to die. And there was nothing she could do about it. Otherwise, a mom wouldn't go through all that trouble to give birth and then leave their child behind, right? And, and in my mind, the, you know, she wanted to preserve that milk, give it to her calf that had already lived the year and, and make that one strong and work. But some of the locals had asked me, hey, Mike, can you, can you go grab that baby and take it to a wildlife rehabilitator? And... Just because they asked me to, I did it. And I didn't feel good about it at all. I, 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 I watch these animals. My, my wildlife biology is from sitting and shutting up and listening and watching. And they teach me everything. It's not out of a book. It's straight from them. And, and sure enough, we took it to the wildlife biologist. Two days later, it died. And so I, I think that's the perfect scenario. If it's a human cause casualty, I think a human should try and remedy it when, whenever possible. But nature, like I said, you know, like those coyotes killed that brand new baby, but that mom, after she had her mourning period, she, she let it go because she knew she fed these other parts of this ecosystem and that's the circle of life that ain't always pretty, but it's the way it works. So that's my two cents on that. Mm -hmm. and what, anyone else want to add something to that question, answer? I, I'd like to add something. Go ahead, Dan. You know, we, uh, we have quite a few buffalo here and we try to uh, do absolutely as little contact with humans as we can do. Um, never had a vet on the place in 25 years. Um, we do lose babies occasionally, not very often, you know, one or two a year. Uh, and the hardest part of this job is to walk away from that situation, uh, like Mike just described. That's the humanness in us. It's just uh, you want to help, but you know intellectually that there's nothing you can do. And those ones that get taken to the rehab people, I also deal a lot with birds of prey, and almost never are they rehabilitated. And it, it amounts to a, a torture a lot of times. So I think that, you know, we got to get tough. This is, this is, not a fairy tale. This is a real deal. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. 
we'll do. Uh, well, you raised your hand earlier too, so we'll we'll do you, and then and then. Well, this is particularly for the managed, you know, holistic management, and I'm not sure if that's where you're coming from as well. Anyone that's working with trying to reestablish the the movement of animals in a more natural way across the landscape. Um, and, you know, there, I've been reading books about this for the last few years, the soil will save us and the earth soil, I, and, you know, uh, the Courtney White books on how we can call carbon back into the, into the soil. I drive across the Midwest periodically. There's hardly any soil left. It looks like this gray lifeless stuff. There used to be like 12 feet of rich black soil. And I know people that are doing managed grazing even in Washington and noticing in a couple of years, they've got more diversity of grasses. They've got more, their soil is growing just because they're moving their happy cows from one paddock to the next. And, you know, goats and chickens, everything is just following in a more natural pattern. And they're noticing without having even to see some of the more, uh, like as far as I know, what I've heard is that there used to be like 75 species per square foot in the tall grass prairie. I have some friends that are bringing back the prairie. It is not just grass. It's an enormously diverse system. It's beautiful, but it's, it's chaotic in our, it's not these beautiful amber fields of grain. It's a whole messy, beautiful, uh, diversity, and I'm wondering if that's starting to come back because that's, as far as I can see, that's our hope is getting the carbon back into the ground. And I'm wondering if that's part of the motive, what you're doing. I think I know Alan Savory talks about this. I'd just like to hear more about what's the background vision for keeping buffalo and how, you know, obviously private <laughs> property is in the way of actually moving across the whole landscape, but. Uh, it seems to me, if we're going to talk about what about the, the children, what about the coming generations, we have to talk about fences. And, we have to, and, and I think that your, your way of putting it has a better chance than talking about economic systems and so on. How, how, uh, if, anyway, I'll let, let it go. If I could jump in here, because you've touched upon something that's really a big deal in our ranch and in our meat business. Uh, this whole idea about carbon is huge. We've known it for a long time. We've done quite a bit of carbon sampling out here and, and have noticed the difference between uh, buffalo, uh, where buffalo have been for 20 years and where cattle have been for 100 years. There is there is a difference, it's measurable, it's important. But the big part of the Great Plains and carbon is that to raise buffalo to be put into a feedlot which 90 some percent of them are is to encourage the depletion of carbon in a massive way and any way you can keep an animal particularly a buffalo in my way of thinking out of a feedlot is a plus and you know we have to these amber waves of grain that you mentioned that's like poison, and we have to understand that. I think probably everybody at this conference knows that, but almost nobody else knows it. Hmm. <laughs> Who's got anybody else on that? You, Mike, did you have something? You looking at me, and you said buffalo, and I always perk up at that. So. The mic, <laughs> put, the, put the mic up, Mike. Um, yeah, I, to me, it's like. This whole buffalo issue is based on prejudice. Um, this this whole thing is based on a disease that was given to our wildlife in Yellowstone by ha 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 the holy cow that they brought over from Europe, and now they're worried about them daring to give this disease back to the holy cow in this process. But they don't really care if the elk do it and the elk have transmitted it, the buffalo never have. And, you know, they basically, the state of Montana has 
deemed our last wild buffalo as an animal in need of disease control. And so they have no white rights whatsoever as soon as they get to the border. But on the contrary, they've given hundreds or millions of acres, hundreds of miles surrounding Yellowstone in this area they call the designated surveillance area for the disease. And so, you know, the elk are allowed to wander way out of the Yellowstone ecosystem and really, where I live, I feel really gifted because Yellowstone is surrounded by Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. And we have so much national forests, public lands. This is a place we can have this big explosion happen again. I, I often say I, I really envision the Madison Valley being like the Serengeti, you know, because it has that potential. We still have the animals, but when prejudice locks one animal in and lets another one out, you know, that's kind of where we're at. You know, the, the cattle industry, and I'm sure you, you know this a lot, Dan, just trying to raise domestic bison in the United States. They really look at, at bison as a, as a competition and they don't really want to make them flourish again. And, and with this prejudice, especially in the good old boys, old West, that's what we're running into. But yeah, I mean, we have the land, we have the animals, we have all the potential. We just got to find that uniting voice that makes us want to love Buffalo again, that makes us want to bring Buffalo back. Because once we have the desire as a people and we make that happen, it can happen. Mm -hmm. We just got to be there. And, you know, as one of my mentors of life, his name's Brock Evans, and he was one of the authors of the Endangered Species Act and so much more. And he has this mantra that goes, endless pressure, endlessly applied, will create change. So don't ever give up and drive them to hell in the handbasket because we're going to win this war. Or we ain't going to be able to live here anymore. It's that simple. So Yeah. Precious, precious. What, can, what can you share on this? You talk about fences, talking about the, the return of the system, and, and how does this work with all our, our fences? And, and you mentioned holistic management. What, what could you address to this? It was kind of a multifaceted question, but what comes up, what comes up for you? Okay. Um, in, in our situation, we really do not recommend fences um, because fences are in the national park and they literally blocked animals or wildlife is free moving things. So in the communal land, we do not have fences. We try and create these virtual boundaries so that first of all, people can relate and their animals can also move around by <laughs> plant to return back this chaos, this beautiful chaos that you mentioned. Because we're really managing complexity. <laughs> and so we have to fit into the natural flow of things. What I've seen is with fences, elephants destroy bushes because they are limited to one small space and so they can clear the whole place which we call overgrazing or overbrowsing. We find them destructive because they are unnatural. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, I know you you've been this I will get to you right now. Let's do this. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to share on our last one before we get one more question, I think. Here we go. Okay. My name is Libby Atkins. I live in Port Townsend, and I'm a part of a group called the North Olympic Orca Pod. And we attend events in orca costumes. And uh, we go like to the May Day Parade, or we go to Seattle. I think we're going to go up to the um, Free Toki Tay, who's also known as Lolita down in Florida, March in Friday Harbor in, in late May. But what I wanted to see is I wanted to remember Taliqua and her baby. And to say that I think not only 
are we trying to make allies with the animals? But the animals are trying to make allies with us. Mm. And the way Taliqua did this is she's part of the Southern Resident Orcas. They live in a hugely toxic environment. All of their first children, two of one, usually die because mom is offloading the toxins in mother's milk. Well, Taliqua had a baby and her baby died. And we so needed another female. Uh, we're about, uh, we're looking at losing this, this group of orcas who eat only salmon. Uh, anyway, her baby died and she carried her child all around the San Juan Islands for 17 days, over a thousand miles. Wow. She carried her baby until her baby could no longer be carried. It just fell apart. And what I think she was doing was trying to communicate with us. They need our help. And I'm not trying to anthropomorphize. I think they are teachers. And uh, they have a lot of things to teach us if we can pay attention. And um, so uh, not only do we want to be allies with them, but they want to be allies mm -hmm. with us if we will take the time to listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank for, you. for coming. Appreciate you. We have, to, we have to clear for the next one. And thank you, all our panelists. And thank you, everyone online. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Dan. Love you guys. Thank you. And thank you.